On the 12th of September 2014, William Tyrell went to visit his foster grandmother in Kendall, which is in Australia, and it's around a four hour drive away from Sydney. He went with his foster parents and five year old sister. His grandmother's house is directly across from the Kendall State Forest, and between 10 am and 10.25 am, Tyrell and his sister were playing hide and seek in the front and backyard. His mother and grandmother were sat outside supervising them. His mother went inside to make a cup of tea, but she began to get worried after she had not heard him for a few minutes. She began to look for him, and she searched in the yard and through the house, but couldn't find him anywhere. Shortly after, Tyrell's father returned after going to Lakewood on business. They began to search the streets and knocking on the neighbours' doors. By 10.56, his mother had phoned the emergency services to report him missing, and the police arrived within 10 minutes. Hundreds of the police and fire service and members of the community searched for day and night. Specialist police, including the Sex Crime Squad, were immediately formed. Motorcycles and helicopters were even brought in to search for him. Over the night, 200 volunteers searched on the land, and the police divers searched waterways and in the dams. The police even searched every house in the estate that surrounds Benaroon Drive several times. The police sniffer dogs were brought in, and they managed to detect Tyrell's scent, but only within the boundaries of the backyard, like he never left. The police have even interviewed more than 1,000 people in connection with the case. But despite all of their best efforts, they were unable to come up with any leads to the whereabouts of the small boy. His mother's last memory was Tyrell running towards the side of the home, whilst imitating a tiger's roar. And then, silence. That was the last time she ever heard him again. Number 2 Although the two-year-old Amber Rose Smith was missing for only one day, and usually when people go missing that are then found, the mysterious element of the story is solved, and it's no longer strange or creepy. However, in this case, her reappearance makes things even stranger. Her story is possibly one of the most bizarre and intriguing disappearances I've ever read about. The young girl was happily playing in her home in Michigan, under her father's supervision. She was out of her father's sight for only a brief moment, as he went into another room in the house. Upon his return, she had vanished in that small amount of time. A full-scale search involving numerous volunteers was launched immediately. However, despite the entire area being thoroughly searched, it appeared that Little Amber had disappeared into thin air. The following day, the search continued, and since they didn't find her anywhere in the vicinity, it was starting to look that Amber may have been abducted as a two-year-old couldn't have gotten far without people noticing her, especially with the amount of people that were looking for her. So things weren't looking too good. But then, Amber Rose was found, and only a few miles away from her home. And what makes this case even stranger, is that she was discovered in a location that had already been thoroughly searched the previous day. How she managed to avoid the search teams who went into action as soon as she disappeared, remains a total mystery. As well as she managed to cover so much ground at just the age of two. The whole situation has left searchers and investigators completely baffled. Number 3 On the 13th of January, 1976, one of the strangest and most controversial missing person cases in the history of Australia took place. Ellie Wartledge 
who was just the age of eight, vanished from her home in Victoria. Ellie lived with her parents, her father Lindsay and mother Patsy, along with her two younger siblings. It was Ellie's four-year-old brother that noticed she was not in her room at 7.30am and he alerted his parents. He also later told the police that he thought he had heard robbers who had kidnapped his sister, but he was too scared to say anything because he thought that they would take him too. He reported hearing crackling noises in her room during the night, which would suggest that somebody was walking over her sea grass covered floor, but there was no sign of a struggle. This led the police to believe that Ellie was lured from her bed by someone whom she knew and trusted, and she had simply left the house through the front door, which had been left unlocked during the night. There was a small opening that had been cut in the flywire screen on her bedroom window, which would suggest that she could have been abducted by an intruder. However, forensic evidence seemed to suggest that the opening had been cut from inside the bedroom, and that the abduction scene had been potentially staged. With this evidence, the police started treating Ellie's parents as possible suspects. This was because they were recently about to separate and the father, Lindsay, was supposed to move out of the home on the very day his daughter went missing. However, a prowler known to be in the area at the time was a possible suspect, so there are currently two theories as to what happened to the poor girl. At around midnight the previous night, one of the neighbours had spotted an unidentified young man walking alongside the fence line of the Wallage home. And around the same time, another neighbour reported seeing a young man darting across the road and jumping over the fence onto the Wallage house. Neighbours also reported hearing the sound of a child's cry, followed by a car door slamming, which happened at around 2am. Two other neighbours reported hearing a prowler outside their home at the same night, and one of the neighbours then discovered that his tool shed had been broken into and curiously, the perpetrator had removed some items and left them round the side of the house. A green station wagon, which did not belong to any of the residents, was also seen parked in the neighbourhood that night, and the car never came back again. The description of the car also matched a car that had been recently stolen, which would make the car a perfect kidnapping vehicle. And the last part of evidence that I found incredibly chilling is that an unidentified man had been going door to door around the neighbourhood, claiming to be conducting a survey on child education, which means that somebody could have been possibly scouting out the houses for a child to abduct. But despite all this, the police couldn't rule out the parents as possible suspects. As I mentioned before, the police claimed that the hole in the fly screen window that had been cut from the inside was too small for an adult to fit through. This was the biggest indicator that this whole thing could have been staged. The front door was also left unlocked through the night and both parents claimed they simply forgot to lock it, which seemed to be incredibly suspicious. But the mother Patsy was openly suspicious about her husband with the police and believed he was more than capable of orchestrating Ellie's disappearance in order to prolong their marriage and prevent the separation. He did in fact postpone the date that he was supposed to leave the house after his daughter's disappearance, and he also did this several times. And not only that, other people began to talk, and they felt like the father had come across extremely unemotional following his daughter's disappearance. And in 2002, Lindsay was given a lie detector test but the test came back inconclusive. In my personal opinion, I believe it was an intruder that did this, and they maybe tried to make it look staged in order to frame the parents to get away with the crime. The homicide cold case detectives reinvestigated the case in 2001, but they were unsuccessful. And Lindsay Wallage died in 2017 
41 years after his daughter's disappearance. No one has ever been arrested in her abduction, which is now considered a cold case. I just want to say a big thank you to my recent Patreons. YouTube is demonetizing my content the second I upload it, so if you feel like supporting the channel, I'll leave my Patreon in the description below. If you find my content interesting or enjoyable, please share it around, or at the least, give a like and a comment. This will help smaller channels like mine grow. Thank you.